Well, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, the main thing in four short years is I will be 67 years old, and, and so you know, that, that, that's going to color a little bit about how I look at things like TAVR. You know, my disclosures, as Greg said, I've, I've been very uh, involved in the TAVR trials. I sit on either steering committees or national PIs for a number of the trials. Uh, missing Portico, and I'm missing Edwards, but I'm still open, guys. Uh, we'll be starting Portico soon. We, we're, we're just now getting cranked up on that. So what do we know? And so Tom gave you a little bit about what we know. This is the Partner A randomized trial survival curve to five years that Mike Mack presented at ACC last year. This is really an amazing curve. Most people don't understand how amazing the partner trial is. This is the first trial that came out of the dock. And we all know that medical therapy for aortic stenosis is death, but the people who were treated in partner B, we didn't know if we were going to beat medical therapy or not. They were so sick. And we certainly had no idea what was going to happen in partner A, and yet we ended up with these curves that really sit right on top of each other. Now, as Tom mentioned, you know, in this particular trial, the rate of stroke was twice what it was in surgery. It was about 5% versus 2.5%. By two and a half years, that had reversed itself. But that is what led Hartzell Schaaf to write when this was first published uh, by Craig Smith, success, but at what price? This is the core valve survival to two years that I presented at ACC last year. We showed statistically significant superior survival at one year, very controversial, mainly because, number one, this had never been shown before. Number two, we used a statistical method that was non-inferiority with a pre-built-in hierarchical superiority test. Well, at two years, we no longer had that, and so we just did a standard uh, two-tail log rank, and it still had superiority at 0.04. Now, the thing to remember about this is that every year you go out to maintain superiority, your curves actually have to widen. They can't parallel. They have to widen. And all these curves come back together eventually because everybody dies. At ACC, my good friend Michael Deeb is going to present the three-year data, and you'll have an idea of where these curves are going. But this was astounding, superior survival in catheter valves over surgery. And all stroke was numerically less. Very strong trend, 0.05 two-tail log rank. Doesn't quite make it, but you know what? Even though a statistician will tell you these lines are the same, I want my mother on the yellow line. So there were some other clinical endpoints that I think are important, and I think as you think about TAVR going forward that you need to think about. TAVR had more vascular complications. Most of those are going away. For people who did the partner trial, like, like Greg, he'll tell you, they were putting pipes up people's arteries. Now we're doing 92% of what we do transfemorally with 14 French equivalent introduction. Our vascular complication rate is way down. Pacemaker implants, higher and higher in the self-expanding valves, and a little bit higher now that they've gone into S3, and evolutes come down. Now they're about 13% in both. So getting better. But in surgery, we had more bleeding and life-threatening life or major bleeding with transfusions, more AFib, and more acute kidney injury. What's interesting about these is all three of these have an early impact on your survival and a late impact on your survival. The, the effect of acute kidney injury goes on and on and on even if you get better. New York class, they got better in both groups. Why? Because surgery and TAVR both got rid of aortic stenosis. So if your symptoms were for aortic stenosis, you got better. Now this was interesting data. Uh, Tom showed you earlier that the <coughs> flow hemodynamics in the randomized partner trial were just as good between surgery and TAVR. In fact, they were on top of each other, which was really a win for TAVR. In this trial, the flow dynamics were superior at every time point for TAVR over SAVR. Single digit uh, mean gradients, and almost an effective orifice area of two. Why is that important? Ramatula showed us a long time ago that if you had an effective orifice area less than two, you're okay at rest. But as soon as you start to exercise and increase your flow, if you're not at least two, you can't keep up with your flow demand. Because remember, this goes up on the square of the radius. And two seems to be the magic number that you ought to shoot for. Paravalvular leak, this is one area where, in the early studies, surgery consistently won. A little less in the core valve trial than in the partner trial, and we did notice that what we saw at one month got better by one year because this valve continues to expand. But we'll talk about newer valves as we went on. We took the core valve trial and we did a sub-analysis. It didn't matter if you're older or younger, male or female, big or little, good EF, bad EF, diabetes or no diabetes. TAVR was favored in every group. Didn't matter if you'd had a previous CAB or not. This was interesting because the partner trial, if you had a previous CAB, you did better with surgery, which was not, it was kind of counterintuitive, and I don't think any of us really understand that. Here, you're better off having TAVR. Didn't matter if you had peripheral vascular disease or not, hypertension or not, STS above or below seven, favored TAVR. 
The last group really kind of surprised me, STS above or below seven. Didn't surprise me that Tabor would do good in the high risk. You take somebody high risk, then they have all these other problems, I can do a perfect operation. Perfect, great valve, everything goes perfect, and they still die. They've got so many things wrong with them, they die. But as we move to lower risk, your survival should depend on the quality of my surgery, not on how sick you are. But for the STS less than seven, we found there was still statistically superior survival for TAVR over SAVR. Again, this is a post hoc analysis, so you know statisticians will tell you don't pay attention to this, really just food for thought, and it'll let you think about what's going to be presented at ACC coming up, the partner 2A, and the one-year result of FS3, intermediate risk, and hopefully at ACC 2017 will give you the Sertavia results. So for high risk, if you want to do TAVR versus SAVR, we really need to show equivalent or better mortality, hemodynamics, morbidity, quality of life, durability, and patient acceptance. Well, mortality, the data, it's at least as good, if not better, for TAVR versus SAVR. Hemodynamics, at least as good, if not better, for TAVR over SAVR. Quality of life, I didn't give you the KCCQ. Tom showed that earlier. But what we found is that TAVR went up more quickly. But by six months, surgery caught up, and by one year, they're exactly the same. But both groups had very large improvements in quality of life. Patient acceptance, I'm not going to give you any data on that. Everybody walks in your office, they want a TAVR. Sometimes you have to tell them, you know, you're here for coronary disease. I know you've read about TAVR. You don't get one of those. <laughs> Everybody wants a TAVR. Morbidity, there's still morbidity we need to work on. PVL, pacemaker. I didn't even throw stroke up here. Stroke was a big issue going when we started this. And that's one way how we sold it to our patients in the, in the high-risk randomized trial was, well, you know, in the partner trial, stroke risk was twice as much. Maybe we ought to, you know, randomize this. But the data as we move forward, stroke's a bad thing. Stroke's a horrible thing whether you have surgery or whether you have a TAVR, but it's no greater in TAVR than it is in surgery. What we're really finding out is we as surgeons did a lousy job of recording stroke. The stroke rate in STS has no bearing on reality, zero bearing on reality. And in fact, Joe Bavaria Penn actually took his data and they looked at the strokes they reported to the STS, then they went back over all the charts of the neurologist, and they found, first of all, they didn't even report to the STS all the strokes that they had identified as surgeons. There was a bunch of them in there that just forgot the report. And then the neurologist went over it and found 30% more. And so bear in mind when you read these, once we did the partner trial, every other trial after that had NIH stroke scales and neurology adjudication. So these are much better stroke trials. Now, as we move forward, remember the NIH stroke show just covers your motor area and some of your cerebellum. It doesn't cover your whole brain. And so now we're getting even more, uh, uh, more sophisticated. And durability, we don't know durability. We're not going to know durability from the partner trial. We're not going to know durability from the core valve ID. These people are too old. They're going to die before we know durability. So as we move to lower risk patients and we're thinking about 2020, what's likely to change? And how's it going to change? Well, mortality is going to change. The question is, is it going to change as much in each group? Or is it going to change differentially? Hemodynamics, they're not going to change. The valve is the valve. No matter how what your risk is. So the valve, we know what the hemodynamics are going to be. Morbidity, it's going to change. Again, it, and again, the question is, how is it going to change? Is it going to change at the same rate? Because if it changes at the same rate and we say non-inferior, that's a win for TAVR. All you have to be is as good as surgery. Quality of life, that's really not going to change. The quality of life is dependent on how well you relieve aortic stenosis, and both these things do it. Durability. I should put two or three question marks because durability is, 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 is a function of how old you are when we put these valves in. Nobody knows why. We all have our own theories. I think it's a low-grade foreign body immune reaction. The older you get, the less robust your immune system is. But we know the older you are when we put in a biologic valve, the, the, the slower it degenerates. And as we move into lower risk, we're going to move into younger patients. I always look upon this as age and comorbidities. I can have an 85-year-old person that looks perfect. They're still a good tavern candidate because they're 85 years old. I can have a 65-year-old that has all sorts of comorbidities that's a good TAVR candidate. And so there's a combination of age and morbidity. And patient acceptance, that's really not going to change. Everybody wants a TAVR. So how about lower risk data? Do we have it? Well, we know already in the U.S. that we're moving towards lower risk. If you look at the transfemoral TAVR data in the TVT registry, which are all commercial cases, the mean STS is 5. Now, if you had told that to the guys that had to run the partner trial, they would have laughed at you. They had to have an STS over 10. Five was considered sissy stuff, and that's what we're doing right now. That's where the world has already gone for us. You can see the slope. And there's a lot of data out of Europe, because Europe has a little more leeway to do this, where they've take, uh, taken people that are lower risk, either intermediate or low risk, and the propensity matched them. And what they found is there's really no difference. There's absolutely no difference in propensity matching. Now, we can 
Are you propensity matching? I would say propensity matching actually favors surgery. Why? Because they're assigned their treatment by a heart team. If they look good, they got assigned to surgery. If they look bad, they got assigned to TAVR. And then they got propensity matched. And so surgery actually should have looked better. To look even is actually a win for TAVR. You saw some of this from, from Tom. I'm not going to go over I'll go over this very quickly because it's lunchtime. What I really want to show you is when you look at things like the intermediate risk, STS of 5.3, 82 years old, pretty much the, the, the comorbidities that you would expect, a little less frail than in the high risk. Mortality, 1.1%, OD ratio of 2.1. If you remember the partner trial randomized, their OD ratio was 0.68 in expert centers. That's really good OD ratio with these sick people, and the core value was 0.61. This is 0.21. These are people that we're going to come in and say, we're going to do, and you're going to have a mortality of 1%, and your stroke rate is going to be 2%. For these people that are 80 years old, that's going to match any surgical group out there. And another thing we noticed is you went to transapical, which was somewhat of an issue with the high-risk group, much less of an issue in the medium, intermediate risk group. Why? Because they can tolerate it. It's also less of an interest because I can't tell you the last time I did a transapical that wasn't a mitral or an aortic or did a, you know, a transaortic. I mean, it's got to be nine months since I've done one. Strokes were very low, particularly disabling strokes. And disabling strokes by VARC is really a tough definition. I mean, your, your, your modified Rankin's only two. When we talked about disabling strokes for the core valve trial with Julie Swain of the FDA, Julie said, listen, if they could play 18 holes of golf when they started and they can only play nine at the end, that's a disabling stroke. It's a pretty tough definition of a disabling stroke. You saw this from Tom. The stroke rate is going down. And more importantly, this is a stroke rate with neurologist adjudication. Surgeons and cardiologists are not good at picking up strokes. I used to always tell my residents that surgeons tended to pick up frank strokes. You know what a frank stroke is, right? Frank's the guy that cleans up my ICU. If he knows you have a stroke, you got a surgeon's stroke. You know, neurologists, neurologists pick up strokes that are a lot less. So paravalvular leak. Paravalvular leak is going down too. S3, it's really about three and a half or four at one month and really moving in, I think, on one year. We're going to see the one-year data at ACC. I think it's going to be very impressive data. Uh, and the, the trend went up in, in the partner 2B trial. We can discuss that at length about why that may be. Is it core lab? But the real answer is, is nobody cares anymore. Nobody does XT. This is, this is old data that really has no effect on what we do or what's going to happen in 2020. There was a trial from, from the Nordic countries called the Notion trial. The Notion trial was a very brave trial. It was a superiority trial with a, with a, a combined endpoint of major stroke, myocardial infarction, and death at one year. And uh, it was an all-comers trial. So it's about 145 in Taver arm, 135 in the Savar arm when we started. And when you got to the one-year endpoint, you did not make superiority. You had a, a combined endpoint of all-cause mortality, stroke, or myocardial infarction of 15.7% in surgery, 11.3% in Taver. Now, a couple of things. Number one, this trial was started a long time ago. It started before we used CT sizing. It was a crazy trial to run for superiority way back then. I can't even imagine they got it through, but they did. And you can also look at this and said if we could quadruple these numbers, we'd have statistically significant numbers in favor of TAVR. And again, the statisticians tell you these lines are exactly the same. I want my mama on the blue line. Death of many cause, if we start to break this out, again, numerically less in TAVR, no statistical difference but we're dealing in very small numbers. We're dealing with 120 people. It's hard to come up with a statistical difference. All stroke, less in TAVR, not statistical, but again, the fear of stroke being higher in TAVR, I think has over and over again been shown not to be something we need to know, worry about. Myocardial infarction, less in TAVR than in SAVR. Now, the other things that we see, the secondary endpoints such as bleeding, cardiogenic shock, acute kidney injury, and atrial fibrillation, again, even in this study, more common in surgery. Important to bear in mind as we go into lower risk, because the question is, is, can we get rid of those? One of the things we did with the high-risk trial is we took everybody that died, and I reviewed the death of everybody with Mike Deeb and Vince Gaudiani to find out why people died. And it's really pretty clear that one of the things that are killing surgical patients are these complications. And they don't die in the first 30 days. They go to an LTAC, and they die at two months. Stanford did a great paper on this, and they looked at the hazard risk of death after heart surgery. And the big risk is at six days and at about 40 days. Why is that? With well, six days, those are people who are so sick we can't save them, they die. Why 40 days? Those are people we kept alive for 30 days, sent to an LTAC, they're no longer our death, and, then, and they go out and die. I would argue that in today's world of surgery and good anesthesia, 
Anything less than a one-year mortality is meaningless data because we can keep almost anybody alive. Valve regurgitation was a lot higher in the notion trial. Well, again, we, we, one of the things that we started with the core valve trials, we demanded everybody have 3D sizing with uh, a CT scan. And I think that changed the world. The partner people eventually moved to that too. And I think if 3D sizing had been done in the original partner trials, the pair of hourly leak rate would have been less. If it had been done in partner two, it probably would have been less. One of the reasons it went down in partner three is, is the valve design, but I bet another one was the, the sizing. You get better sizing. And people have gone back over the partner cases and looked at CTs and said, if we'd have had this CT available, we would have chosen another valve a pretty hefty percentage. I don't remember the exact percentage. You probably know, Greg, but I, it's like 30% of the time you would have changed your valve size, and that would have improved it. There are two intermediate trials out there. There's the partner 2A, which looked at the XT versus surgery, and that's going to be presented at the ACC. And I'm very interested to see what that, that looks like, although I'm not going to get overly worried one way or the other, because again, it's the XT valve. I know from the partner 2B, the results actually looked a little less good than the partner trial. And, and I don't know if that's a core lab or whatnot, but I do know that the S3 looks like a fundamentally different valve and a better valve than XT. And so I think this is going to be interesting data. We're also going to see the partner uh, S3 intermediate risk uh, present at the same time one-year data. We've seen that Shil Gadali presented the 30-day data last year. Now we're going to see the one-year data. And that's going to be very interesting as we start looking to the future. So TAVI is a trial I've had the pleasure to run with Jeff Potma. And it is the core valve intermediate risk trial. Mike and I sat on the screening committee for that. We hope to present that data at ACC 2017. So we'll get this out to you before 2020. Low risk randomized trials. There are now two low risk randomized trials starting. There's the Edwards trial and there's the Medtronic trial. Uh, Michael and I will do the Medtronic trial together. I have the opportunity to run that with Jeff Potma right now. The trials are very similar. They're also going to have a sub, a, a sub study arm looking at leaflet motion abnormalities, something that we saw in the mitral valve something that we've seen now that we've looked for it in every TAVR valve that's out there. We can argue about whether one has it more than the other, but we've seen them in all the valves, and we've seen it in most of the surgical valves we've looked at. And I think we'll see it in all the surgical valves if we look hard enough. But these low-risk randomized trials continue on with what we've, the data that we've been building. We've been, I think we've built the best data that we've ever had for, for valve disease in these trials in the US. Now it's cost hundreds of millions of dollars and it's only been doable because the FDA demanded that, that the companies do it. But again, we have better data now and it's gonna be important to look at this going forward because if we don't have good data, nobody's ever gonna, no surgeons are ever gonna accept this for low risk. And so the integrity of this data is even, to me, even more important than the integrity of the high risk data. It's gotta be good data. And then I have a bunch of my surgical colleagues who say, well, gee, we don't think it's going to win. And my answer is simple. Join the trial, do cases, and beat TAVR. If you think your results are going to be better, be in the trial, do cases, beat TAVR. Generate the data that's out there, and then we could do it. I thought, quite frankly, that, that in the core valve high-risk trial, I thought my surgery was going to beat TAVR. I, I, we, we happen to be the leading site for implantation, and I thought my results were great, and I thought no way we were going to lose. Well, the problem is you've got to put pen to paper. And I think we, we, we're doing this now in intermediate already. Now we need to do it in low risk, and we'll find out where we, where we find. The, the only difference, major difference is, is, is Edwards does have an age cutoff at 65. In Medtronic, there is no age cutoff. It's just the heart team saying you're a candidate for a, uh, a tissue valve. PVL. PVL has been a big issue for us. These are the four valves I currently use. I, we will be adding Portico, Greg, but we're working our way through this. But these are the ones that I am actively implanting uh, in this size, so the direct flow valve. The direct flow valve is a very interesting valve. There's no metal in this. It's hollow Dacron tubes, two rings connected by, uh, by vertical struts with a bovine pericardial valve in it. And you blow this up, and as it blows up, it pushes the valve out of the way. It's an interesting valve. It has some engineering design issues that I, that I worry about, such as these struts have no radial force. And I think what we're going to have to do is design a balloon that sits in there and actually inflate these valves over an expanded balloon. That's the only way we're going to get the gradients that we need. The Lotus is an interesting valve. It's a nitinol valve that expands out to, the, to, the, the, to where you want it. And then it has these buckles and posts connected by wire. And as you twist a knob, it shortens up. And as you shorten something, what happens? It widens out. And so it has radial force that's greater than the core valve, or Evolute, but less than the S3. 
And I can take this particular valve and deploy it to it's 100% deployed, and I can look at it inside if I like it. If I don't like it, I unlike it, I move it, I deploy a different area, put a different valve in. You never have to leave the valve without a result that you consider a, 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 a perfect valve. Plus, they've added a sealing skirt on this just like S3 did. The Evolute is, is the new Medtronic valve after core valve. It's got some design feature changes. They've made the radio force more consistent across the inflow skirt. They've lowered the skirt a little bit, which is the granddad. I'm all for lowered skirts. I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> and that, that leads to better sealing. As a granddad, I'm all for better sealing. And, and, it, and it has a, 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 a the, the bottom five millimeters is flatter. It's not so cone shaped. And we, we did that to try to decrease the rate of pacemakers. And the rate of pacemakers seems to be down about the 13, 14%. S3 is the new Edwards valve. You've seen that a little bit earlier today. It's cobalt chromium with bovine pericardium. And they added the sealing skirt in there to, to try to uh, stop it. This is the direct flow valve from the discovery trial in Europe. One year, no moderate or severe paravalve relief. 80% none to trace and 20% mild. That looks awful lot like a surgical valve there, as far as PVL goes. And so you can see there's some engineering factors that can go into this that are going to change some of the things that we worried about early on. This is the reprise two data for the Lotus valve out of Europe. You look at one year, no moderate to severe PVL, 86% none, 2.3% trace, 11% mild. You come, if your surgeons come up with data like this, you're going to be happy. Now, why is this important? The partner guy showed us that if you had mild, moderate, or severe paravalve leak, each one of those had an increased hazard ratio of death. Paravalve leak is bad. And in fact, there's going to be some studies coming out that even if you parse it into seven different categories, which is what we're talking about for VARC-3, each category has an increased hazard ratio. Now, when we first did the core valve trial, only severe paravalve leak had a, rate, a, a, a an effect on mortality. But that was really because we needed more numbers. We're going to show you the data will come out that paravalve leak is bad. It's bad with all valves. Doesn't matter the valve, it's bad. But this kind of data looks a lot like a surgical valve. The S3, it's about 3.5, 3.8 between the, at one month between the European stuff and, and John Webb's Canadian stuff. The S3 from the Europe is about 3.5. The, the US data will be coming out soon. Again, all better than what we had. But the truth is, we're arguing about moderate to severe. By 2020, we're going to be talking about mild only. How do you get rid of the last vestiges of mild? Moderate or severe, just like in surgery, is going to be totally unacceptable. And it's going to be like surgery. You're going to be expected to leave the room with the right valve in the right place with no PVL every single time like a surgeon does. So this is, a trend. This is what we see in one month as PVL has gone down. Again, we, 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 the engineering has led to this. And we're getting down to valves at one year that have no moderate or severe paravalve relief. And that's one, when you look at the, the core valve curves and you see that they're not coming together, you have to ask yourself, well, the balance of things are clearly in favor of the core valve because they're not collapsing yet. And so what is it? It, it? Once you get beyond one year, what kills you? Well, it's no longer procedural stuff. It's the residual stuff that has to do with your valve. Do you have a leak? What are your gradients? And, and so far, at least in that valve, the preponderance of, of evidence is that they favor the valve. But even in the early partner one sapien, it didn't get worse over five years. So at least it was a balance. And remember, the partner trial, when the partner trial was done, the core valve trial were done, every site that was selected was an expert, experienced aortic valve center. When I started doing core valve, I'd already done surgical aortic valves for almost 30 years. But every site was a novice to tavern. I did my first tavern nut trial. My interventional cardiologist, Neil Kleiman, did his first tavern nut trial. I suspect if we go to Greg and other people in this trial, they did their first taverns in the trial. So we were comparing a, a, a mature therapy by experts with a novel therapy by novices. And so you know that's going to change with time, too. So predictions for 2020 as we move forward. PVL will be largely solved and similar to surgical aortic valve replacements with engineering design improvements and you will not have to let go of your valve or leave the room with PVL you dislike, ever. Because all these valves are looking to be, uh, all of them except for the balloon expandable, are looking to be valves that you get a second shot at before you have to leave it. And even Edwards is working on its own self-expanding, so it can fill that, notch, uh, that niche in the market too. Now here's some other interesting data. When we looked at the core valve data, 
I already showed you that the hemodynamics were superior for TAVR over SAVR. And then we looked at LV mass regression, thinking, well, the LV mass regression has clearly got to be better for TAVR, right? Because you got better hemodynamics. Well, it wasn't. So why is that? Shouldn't you have less mass if you have better hemodynamics? Well, the, the truth is we, LV mass is calculated by echo, and it's a formula. And it's the, it's the septal width minus, and the posterior wall width and the LV end diastolic dimension cubed that determines your LV mass. And the only difference was RV had less end diastolic volume. Why is that? Because when we operate on you, we put in cardioplegia, we freeze your heart, we make your heart stiff, and what happens? Your stroke volume goes down. And your stroke volume stays down for about six months. Now, if you're young, that's okay. You'll live that six months. But if you're sicker, that's a problem. We hurt your heart with surgery. That is not going to change as we move into low risk. What's going to change is that people will tolerate it better, but we still hurt your heart. The other thing we find is that we hurt the right ventricle more with surgery than we do with TAVR. Right heart failure is more common with surgery than TAVR. And I don't know about the rest of you out there. I don't mind a bad left heart, but I hate a bad right heart. A bad right heart is the bane of your existence. So these are things that, are, that, that to me, make me think that we do have equipoise to test these therapies against each other. So another prediction is that surgical aortic valve hurts the heart for at least six months, and this isn't gonna change by 2020, unless we figure out a way to not stop the heart, and not give cardioplegia, and not use the pump. Now this is another interesting thing that, that, that Mike Deeb and I are working on with our friend Vince Gaudiani from, from, Florida, from uh, California. As I mentioned, um, we took every death in the high-risk trial and there's a printed death summary, and I had them send it to me, and I printed, I said I printed it out, and I had to refill my printer several times, because I had this huge stack of papers. And I sat down over a weekend, and I read every single one of those, and made a narrative about why the patient died. And we're gonna present that at the AATS. So I'm not gonna talk about that, but it's come to the AATS, it's really very interesting. What's really interesting is looking at the instantaneous hazard ratio over time. There's a huge instantaneous hazard ratio on the day of your procedure. Why? Because that's when we, inter we intervene with you. I mean, I remember when the doctors went on strike in LA and the death rate went way down because doctors were on strike because we weren't doing anything, you know? <laughs> now, those people were gonna die later, but you know, that was, that was always the interesting story is LA doctors go on strike, mortality plummets. Uh, and if you look at why people died in the tavern arm, it was almost always a technical disaster with new teams doing this. We punctured the ventricle, you know, we made VSDs. We had things that, that we hardly ever do anymore. Now that we've done, here we've done 700 of them but we did things that we never did before. So, so that yellow line is gonna plummet. The blue line, that's probably not gonna change much for the same high-risk patients, because these were all experienced surgeons. And then we saw a fall to 30 days. And in 30 days, you know, we had the hazard ratio was about the same, but then surgery popped up. Why does surgery pop up? Because they have more of these complications that kill you. These were older, sicker patients. They went to, an, to LTAC, they survived for a week or a month, and then they just gave up the ghost and they died. And then by four years, it comes back together again, and they parallel each other. And after, after a year, the things that are gonna kill you are now gonna be the flow dynamics of your valve. And that's gonna be a really interesting thing. It's something that, that Mike Deeb and I have been very interested in and are really parsing carefully. So another prediction for 2020. SAVR is a mature technique. Yeah, we can do it through smaller incisions, and yeah, we're getting better ways of doing it, and, and, and I think that's gonna help us incrementally, but those are gonna be small incremental things. The most exciting thing to me about the sutureless valves is not that they're easier to put in, but that they're gonna have flow dynamics closer to TAVR valves. And I think that's gonna help. TAVR is young and is likely to undergo substantial improvements. This has been around a little over a decade. The improvements we've seen in a little over a decade have been astounding, astounding. And we have the next decade to go. And in fact, when we look at the mitral, people look at the mitral now and they say, well, 10.9 is the only one that doesn't have a 50% mortality. This will never work. But they forget in the early days of TAVR, the mortality of TAVR in the early days was 50%, not 30 day, 30 minute. You put your valve in and either it was a stunning success or the guy died. Uh, you know, but we don't see that now. That's what it was like when we started. In fact, the partner trial in the feasibility had to be halted for a while, just like some of the mitral valves have been, had to be halted, but we'll see that. And I think technical disasters have already, my slide goes down, but technical disasters have already been decreased quite a bit. So another prediction, we used to ask which patients are bad for TAVR, uh, for SAVR. If they're bad for surgery, let's do a TAVR on them. I think we're changing our philosophy. We're now starting to look at these patients, so which ones are bad for TAVR? Which ones have a bad anatomy for TAVR? If they have a bad anatomy for TAVR, then let's do surgery on them. 
It's a total difference in philosophy about how we approach these things. And things like bicuspid valves and calcium that extends in the LVOT, these are things we still have to work out. Now, I'm pretty confident that we'll have engineering solutions to all of these, but there's still things we have to work out. So we talk about risk. And we used to show these little boxes, low risk box, intermediate risk box, high risk box, extreme risk box. First of all, how do you define the boxes? And second of all, they're not very clear. Risk is a spectrum. And there's, there's a blending from one risk stratification to the next. But there are clearly two lines that we don't go past. One at the upper end of risk, where they're so sick that no matter what we do to them, we're not going to make them better. I can always get rid of your stenosis every time, 100% of the time. But then there's some people that are going to die anyway. Those are futile patients. We shouldn't treat them. And the biggest mistake I made when I started my program is I treated everybody. I was so excited to have this. They'd wheel somebody in a wheelchair, 90 years old, with, you know, on oxygen. And, and the Grim Reaper is right there behind them wheeling them. And I go, hey, said, wait a minute, buddy. we got to treat first. We, we, we've learned that there's some people you just don't treat. And that improves the quality. And it's also important because if we do this, we're going to spend everybody's money and this, this therapy is going to go away. And then there's a lower line below which we haven't gone because we haven't had the data. But we know that both those lines are moving to the left. And if durability is found, my prediction for 2020 is the line's likely to move like that. And that all risk categories will be TAVR candidates as long as they're anatomically feasible. And what I always try to tell my residents when I'm talking about this is that we've crossed the Rubicon. For those of you who aren't versed in history, remember when Julius Caesar came back into Rome as, 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 as a governor of one of the provinces, you couldn't bring your troops in. If you did and brought them into the province of Rome, it was a capital offense. And the Rubicon, this little tiny river in northeast Italy, was the boundary line. And if you crossed the Rubicon, the die was cast, there was no, no going back. Well, I can tell you for Taver, the die has been cast. There is no going back. The best thing to do is learn how to do this and be an expert in it. Thank you very much.